Okay, chapter two, integration of the instant command system. Our objectives for this chapter. Explain what the instant command system is and why it is effective. Describe the five major functional areas of the instant command system. Explain how the concept of area command helps to oversee the management of multiple instances. Identify the management characteristics of instant command system. Explain the importance of using common terminology. Identify the common terminology used in an instant command system. And explain the similarities and differences between area command, instant command, and unified command. Now it is essential for this section that you ensure that you understand the importance of using clear language during communication. As well as we're going to have to make sure that we really understand the importance of span and control. And we're also going to talk about the importance of communication and as well as too little is bad, too much is also problematic. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So the most familiar component of NIMS is obviously ICS or the Instant Command System. And I apologize, there's a lot of redundancy uh, in these chapters, but that's okay, it just makes it easier to remember. Remember, it is a system of domestic instant management that has a flexible structure and uses common terminology, positions, and instant facilities. Now, most instances, of course, are managed locally and are handled by your local communication within a single jurisdiction. ICS has a flexible core methodology for coordinating all collaborative incident management. ICS is used to organize on-scene operations for emergencies from, of course, small to complex instances, both natural and man-made. Again, this is all a little bit of review. Now, some of the meat and potato stuff. Incident Command System has five major functional areas that we're going to talk about. Command, Operation, Planning, Logistics, Finance, and the number six is no longer optional anymore, but that's kind of uh, intelligence uh, slash investigations or uh, law enforcement kind of, kind of branch there. So those are all the major components. And the important way to think about this is an organizational chart or an org chart where you have you know, people in charge and below them have different levels and those different levels have very specific and different jobs. And of course they all communicate together to get the job done. Okay, so let's talk about the concept of area command, and I hate that they start out with this, but that, that's okay. It's important to kind of wrap your brain around the idea that when you have incidences, let's say a tornado goes through, and uh, you have multiple towns that are affected. Well, now you have three or four different instances going on, and they're all going to need similar type stuff. So these three or four instances now are directing all their requests for help, supplies, communications, etc. to one central point. And that's kind of what area command is. So it is an organization to oversee the management of multiple instances handled individually by separate Incident Command System organizations are to oversee the management of very large or evolving incident engaging multiple incident management teams or IMTs. And it is only activated only if necessary. Area commands are relative to incidences that are not site specific 
are not immediately identifiable are geographically dispersed or evolve over long periods of time. So again, these are things that are going on that are, are spread out. So like when Hurricane Katrina came through, you had flooding, uh, massive flooding throughout. Uh, you had tornado damage from you know the Gulf Coast all the way through up the East Coast. So you would have these area commands set up that would handle s certain disaster areas, uh, geographical areas. So this does require coordination and intergovernmental and non-government offices and private sector responses. So this is again a way for all of us to work together for the common good. So you take your local government, your state government, and your federal government folks. You take your non-government officials and your private sector folks like business people, stakeholders, whatnot, and you have the, all these people working together in the command center pulling together resources to mitigate or minimize the disaster. So when we're looking at the org chart here, and they do a lot of these, and sometimes I wish they would just start with them because to me it makes it a little easier to understand. But you have your emergency operations center or your um, MAC groups, multi-agency coordination groups here. And they may or may not have an agency administrator executive and an area commander. So the EOC MAC group, and we'll go more into these guys later, they're kind of really at the top of the food chain in terms of like say there's a whole state with a disaster, they're going to be coordinating all the local area commands which may have three different incidences going on incident a incident b and incident c now we'll talk about the concept of incident command and unified command here in a minute but for now on this slide all we need to make sure that we understand is you have three different incidents going on say uh, a could be a flooding b could be fire at a different location and C could be wind and tornado damage at town C and they're all requesting help and support from one area commander and then of course they go on up the food chain to uh, some sort of administrative executive possibly in the federal branch or some emergency operation or MAC group that oversees all the different area command it, it only well, I should say it only. It really just it, it determines on how big and the scale of the incident, on whether or not you have the EOC and MAC groups up and running. So let's look at some of the management characteristics of ICS. ICS depends on a clear communication and is facilitated by using common terminology. Again, we're speaking the same language. And that's not only in facilities such as supply areas to um, equipment. So, for example, um, if you ask for a tanker east of the Mississippi, and this is in terms of the fire service, you would get something that you know held 1,500, 2,000 gallons of water. Uh, if you ask for a tanker west of the Mississippi, you're going to get something uh, falling from the sky, like you know one of those um, fire retardant you know airplanes that you know drop the red uh, mud all over the place to help put the fire out. So that's an example of how terminology is crucial to make sure that okay, if I'm asking for something, I'm getting exactly what I want. And one thing that NIMS does. It helped with terminology. They have a book that's listed, and this book has every piece of equipment and the different requirements uh, for that piece of equipment. So, for example, a Type 1 bulldozer would have an engine that could do this and comes with two personnel, etc. So, some of our organizational functions and functional units that we'll go into is command operations, logistics, groups, divisions, leaders, and supervisors. So this is basically 
going from higher up the food chain to the top for organizational chart down to the leader of a, a small group. Major resources that you'll see uh, when requesting can be personnel and teams, facilities, um, special capability assets, and major equipment and supply items. So when we're looking at incident facilities in common terminology uh, to designate these facilities, you have such things as incident command post, where this is the location where the incident command or unified command manages an incident. You'll have another place known as, for example, staging area, and that is the location in which resources are assigned to an incident but not yet deployed. Basically, uh, they show up, hey, we're ready to go to work, they get checked in, yep, that's great, you're good, we put you on our resource list, hang out here till we call for you. Um, you have other areas such as treatment area, which is a fixed location arranged for the collection or treatment of patients and a mass casualty incident. So those are just a, a few of the terms, and we'll go more into them the more in depth we get into this text. Now we said that NIMS is a modular organization, meaning it can expand and grow or contract as need be. So the ICS organizational structure develops in a top-down fashion. And again, it is based on the size and complexity of the incident and the specifics of the hazard and environment. Incident Command deploys specific structured base on the nature of the incident. So when we're looking at our very simple org chart here, at the top you have your Incident Commander and essentially that is the person in charge and they're the ones setting the objectives. Below the Incident Commander, we're going to look at two of our functional areas here. And what I mean by functional areas is, is that top rung uh, of people that work together to get the incident mitigated. So you'll have an operations section and a logistics section that, of course, coordinate with incident command. Now, logistics would be the people that hang the stuff to handle the incident. And then the operations are actually the ones that carry out you know, strategies and tactics, how to and what to do. And if we look under our operations group in this very simple organizational chart, you have one group that's assigned total to fire suppression, and then you have another group that is perimeter control. So for instance, let's say this, since it's a, got a fire group in there, fire suppression is a very simple house fire incorporating two houses. Well, you have the one person at the top, and let's say that it's the fire chief. And the fire chief tells the operation folks, hey, uh, we need to coordinate the area, make sure no one gets in, and we need to put the fire out. So the operation gets with logistics saying, okay, in order to do this job, I need two fire engines and 20 police officers. Logistics get the resources, then the operations put them to work saying, okay, fire engines, I want you to do X, Y, Z. Police officers, I want you to set up roadblocks at, you know, A, B, and C. Now, it's important to know that your command system expands both horizontally and vertically during an incident. The ability to customize the ICS system demonstrates the flexibility that's inherent in the system. So you may not need logistics. You may only need operations. Uh, you may need finance. Remember, that wasn't one of the other major groups. You may need arson investigation. And those are all examples of your horizontal spread. Uh, and that can be done at any level. Again, what do you need and putting them into this system to ensure everyone knows basically the, the chain of command. In complex ICS structures, note sectors are usually called groups or divisions 
uh, in the wildland firefighting model because uh, a lot of the NIM stuff comes from the forestry uh, which had been managing large-scale incidents for a while so that's why they keep referencing back to uh, wildland firefighter kind of stuff so here is another great organizational chart with vertical and horizontal spread again I'm not so much concerned that you know each one of these because we will go into each one of these positions going throughout the chapter. It's the fact that I want you to understand concepts right now. So at the top, this one has unified command and unified command is basically say the fire chief, the police chief, the mayor, uh, the head of the school system, whatever, are all sitting at the top of the pyramid. They're at the table and they come up with objectives they want done to mitigate the incident. Now below that uh, you have part of what's known as the command staff and you have like a safety officer, liaison officer, and a public information officer. And they have their own little little jobs that help support the uh, unified command at the top. So you know safety reviews a plan, make sure all the worker bees below are doing things safely. The liaison coordinates with some sort of public group or private entity. Uh, basically it has uh, gives stakeholders a seat at the table that are outside the public safety realm. And then you have the public information officer, or PIO, which helps disseminate the information to the public, which is always a good thing. If if you don't give them information, they're going to you know make things up in terms of uh, the media. It would seem. Now below our unified command, we have again part of those five major functional areas: operation, planning, logistics, and finance. And, you know, planning handles basic plans, logistics, supplies, finance pays the bills, and, you know, operation does the work. Now, if we look at our operational org chart here, notice for this particular incident, you have an EMS branch, a fire branch, a police branch, and a public works. And below them, you have your each individual units. That'll be signed a task. So this is a good example of how the org chart works and who reports to who. And of course, ultimately, all the objectives come down from the unified command or the person, instant commander, at the top. With NIMS, everything is managed by objectives. So um, you're, you're using smart objectives. They're simple, measurable, attainable, they're realistic, and they have a time frame. So the approach to define action is related to managing an incident and the operation has the task of translating that strategic objective into specific measurable tactical objectives. So for example, you have your incident commander sitting at the top or unified command, the group of people, and they say, okay, our priority is to evacuate a 10 mile area ahead of this toxic gas cloud coming from this chemical plant. That's what they want done. And there may be more than one objective, but we're, we're just going to do one right now. So they put that objective out, and then that goes down to the operations branch. And the operations branch thinks up ways on, okay, this is what they want done. How are we going to do it? So that's where the strategies and tactics come to play. So our strategy is, um, you know, search and rescue. Our tactic is going door to door and dragging people out, whatever the case may be. So that's kind of how to put things in perspective. So operations handle the work. The incident commander sets the priorities. And then, of course, you know, logistics helps support it by providing the tools. Now, after the tactical objectives are then developed into specific assignments and plans, you know, those individual little units below EMS, fire, etc., law enforcement are all given their marching orders. Uh, they're going to come back and they're going to report, okay, this is what we got done. So you have your measurable outcomes. And this basically um, is a way to see is what we're doing working or do we need to change our strategies and tactics. 
and of course it gives a status update so the instant commanders know what's been done or how far along things are so usually with these objectives they're giving an operational period and those are anywhere between 8 12 and 24 most of the time it's 24 hours but it all depends on the size of the instant so let's say it's 12 hours so you have um, these guys come back they reported that they completed their area of searching and then now the operations chief can report to the instant commander check that objective is done okay what do you want to do for the next 12 hours and it could be you know turn off all utilities gas whatever the case may be and then you know the operation folks start coming up with tasks and assigning who needs to what and that's an example of how things would spread where you would bring in utility folks. Now, the operations section chief does not have to be fire, does not have to be EMS. Um, a lot of times, in my opinion, uh, it, it should be whatever that incident's primary focus is for that period. So if it's more of a fire related thing, maybe you have a fire person, or if it's more law, you have a law enforcement, or for its utilities, you get a uh, utilities type director person so these positions as far as who fills them can change and really they should because you can't expect one person for long incidences to be going for you know three four or five days straight you need downtime so you need to rotate these people out now we said that this provides a written form and what basically gets developed, and this is more on planning, but we'll cover this in another chapter. What these worker bees have at the bottom is an incident action plan or IAP. And this can be oral or written, and it contains those general objectives, and they reflect the overall strategies for managing the incident. Basically, it's saying, okay, you're in group A, your task is to evacuate people on 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th Avenue. And you would have like say another page that go, okay, your group B, your objective is to evacuate everyone from uh, Maple, Spruce, and Dogwood Drive. So here's this plan that all supports that one objective of evacuating the area which was set by the incident commander or unified command folks. Again, that filters down to your operations chief that comes up with the strategies and tactics, which then goes down to the little small election uh, section of the section individuals and uh, the little individual units are what I call, you know, the worker bees. We'll go into uh, exit action plans more later, but right now just understand that it is basically a written plan that has all the important information in it to disseminate to all the individuals. Another key concept is span of control. Now, what is span and control? Basically, it is the number of individuals that one supervisor or manager can basically manage. And in ICS, the supervisor responsibility should be between three and seven with five being optimal. Um, during large scale law enforcement operations, you know, eight to 10 may be uh, an option. Now, there is also a test question, and maybe this time I'll remember to delete it, but there is a little small text box that uh, states a different type of incident uh, in terms of span of control. But uh, I want you guys to put, you know, three to five with seven being, or excuse me, three to seven span of control with five being optimal. Uh, cause that's really the most applicable and the most correct answer. So that's saying that one person in charge has three or five people below them, or excuse me, three to seven below them with five being the optimal number. So some of the pre-designated facilities with common names that again you may have could be the command post where the ICs are, staging areas where again equipment reports to, mass casualty or triage areas, and other 
places as required depending on the incident. A concept of comprehensive resource management should be in play, which includes how resources are requested, staged, used, and sent home and, uh, and counted for. So with resource management, there's a whole chapter on it, but these are great for those people that love logistics. But essentially, it's tracking who do you have on scene, what equipment, and what personnel. So it has that accountability. So you just don't have people self-dispatching, showing up, and you know trying to do something, which I appreciate their help, but you know they could be doing more harm than good, or it could be a duplication of services in the sense that maybe somebody else had already done it and they could be better used somewhere else. So basically, uh, take the tickets at the door, see who's showing up to the party, and then put them to work. And then demobilization is send them home when you don't need them anymore. Now we talked a little bit about communications. Of course, um, one of the secrets to success is knowing how to get along with people and of course communicate. And in 9-11, one thing that they discovered is you had all these different people coming in to help after the towers collapsed and nobody could talk to one another. So you had fire departments from this township couldn't talk to other fire departments or incident command or police officer word of the case. So you had this interoperability problem. So with ICS, there needs to be a infrastructure in place in terms of this integrated communication. So people have either the same radio frequencies, policies, you know, speaking the same language, using plain English, not texts, or single codes, 10 codes or single codes in order to request information and get things done. So you need to have a comm plan in place and that comm plan needs to have identified radio frequencies that everyone has. And to back up for a minute, 10 codes and singles are like, uh, you know, code 8 or single 7 or, you know, 1041, which are all well and great in theory because they shorten the communication process or the amount of time it takes to communicate something. So uh, that's why they originally came up with that system. However, the problem lies in... Um, what do these 10 codes mean in various jurisdictions? So for example, a 1052 in one jurisdiction can mean a suicide attempt by gun. And then you have a 1052 in another jurisdiction and that means, um, hey, uh, we need fuel. So you can see how this could be confusing uh, if we're not speaking the same language. Now another component is transfer of command. Now depending on the incident, uh, there's a couple of ways to look at this, but as the incident grows and you need somebody higher up, say, you know, the incident commander was running the fire scene. Well, now it's burning down a block, so he has his hands full. So now you have, uh, you know, an operations chief and then on up to an incident commander, so forth and so on. So in that incident, you may have to do a transfer of command. Or let's say, you know, you have somebody that's been in charge for 24 hours and now they need to go rest. So now you have a new uh, incident commander for the next operational period. So when you do this, you need to have an established way of transferring command. So the command function needs to be clearly established from the initiation of the incident and operations. When the command is transferred, it includes a briefing that captures all the essential information for continuing safe and effective operations. So um, what I like to say, it, it kind of is a CAN report. Uh, it's uh, current conditions of what's going on, assignments, who's doing what, and uh, basically needs. What do they need? So with that briefing, the new incident commander is brought up to speed in what's going on and are, are now given kind of the, uh, the reins to take over. And this is a good way to use that IAP because it makes it a whole lot easier, especially if it's in written form, um, to so okay, this is what we did, this is where we're at, and who's doing what. 
Now that IAP, Incident Action Plan, can come out during each operational period. So that's a good way to communicate to the subordinates that, okay, during this 24-hour period, so-and-so is the incident commander, now so-and-so is the operations chief, so forth and so on. So it keeps the information updated on who do you report to and how do you get a hold of them or that comp plan, whether it be a cell phone number, radio frequency, etc. So let's talk about unity command and chain of command. Chain of command is a clear line of authority within the structural components of the incident command system. So basically chain of command is like, okay, you have the chief at the top, he gives the order to the deputy chief, which gives the order to the captain, to the lieutenant, uh, onto the FAO or firefighter. Or, you know, that can be the police chief on down to the captain, the lieutenant, patrol officers, etc. So it's that line of succession, very paramilitary type. Now, unity of command means that every individual has one and only one boss at the scene of the incident. So all your orders come from one individual. So that person in charge of that group. So ultimately at the top, you have the fire chief disseminates an order, it goes all the way down, but you as a lone worker at the bottom, you only report to your immediate supervisor. And then he only reports to his immediate supervisor and that's all identified in that IAP or that organizational chart. So that is the concept of unity of command. Not to be confused with unified command, which we'll go more into um, a little later on. But, you know, unified command is when you have several big cheeses at the top all sitting together saying that, hey, I'm the boss in charge. That is unified command, not unity to can't command. Again, unity command saying that you have only one boss and you report only to that boss. So again, here's that unified command, which should be used in instance involving your multiple jurisdictions. So, um, you know, basically you maybe have the fire chief, police chief, uh, mayor, uh, maybe you have multiple cities or counties uh, in one area and they all basically have somebody at the uh, command table, each stating uh, there are two cents in agreeing on what to do to get the job done. So that is your unified command. Or it could be one person, and of course that is your incident commander. As disasters or events get larger, the more times than not you'll have more stakeholders at the top that, you know, want to be the boss. So, you know, we stick all them in uh, the unified command saying they're the ones that come up with the objectives uh, in terms of what needs to get done. Two key factors that are really stressed in the NIM system, accountability and deployment. So accountability has to do with incident safety depends on an effective personnel and resource accountability system, meaning you know who's there and who's doing what. You don't have a bunch of people again running around um, unchecked freelancing. Deployment is personnel and equipment should respond only when requested or dispatched by the appropriate authority. So not only do we know who's there, we're sending who we want to that incident. So again, I mentioned something about, uh, you know, people self-dispatching which is not necessarily a good thing. I, I can appreciate how everybody wants to help, but again, if you don't know they're there, you don't have that accountability, um, that can lead to trouble. Information and intelligent investigation management. The integration of a comprehensive intelligent function is critically important to all response and disciplines. So this goes back to that parallel for those main five functioning groups. So you may have an intelligent investigation slash law enforcement branch. And this really, again, is something that has come to light with the recent events of multiple terrorist incidences. Even though there is a terrorist event going on and we're working on saving people and recovering from it, 
you can't forget the fact that, well, you know, you want to find out who did it, and we need to hold these people responsible. So you need to really have this intelligent investigation subset working in the command system and you know during the initial operations period so any evidence is not destroyed or lost so um, it's something ongoing and not more of an after the fact so uh, this is a brief summary there's a whole lot more into this section but again read the chapter do the review questions and it'll help reinforce this. So NIMS incorporates the previously established components of the incident command system. The components of ICS have not been substantially altered by NIMS at all and the ICS is based on specific well-defined management characteristics. So again these are kind of like a vague objectives. Uh, the actual strategies and tactics or in the meat and potatoes of the chapter so again read it if you have any questions you can call me here in the office at 706-357-0162 or you can email me at a roberts at athens edu and if you haven't done already check your email please do it at least once a week if not daily and of course you can always look in blackboard collaborate ultra or on the calendar, I should say, for the Black Break, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra virtual office hours. So if you have any uh, questions and you want to talk face to face over the computer, we can go ahead and do that as well. All right, gang. So until next time, be safe and have a wonderful day.